talking of the flower, uh, the water pot. Right? So a pot has little water, future life, little, all water thrown away, future life thrown away. Uh, pot turned upside down, spiritual life thrown upside down, and the pot is empty, spiritual life is empty and hollow. Now all these things, because Buddha says in his discourse that if a, if a recluse makes a deliberate lie, and is not ashamed of it. Okay? So just now I asked him to think about it. So is it possible to, to make a deliberate lie and not be ashamed of it? On what occasions? Is it possible? You think of patience where uh, sometimes you, it's just not possible for you to, to say what you actually want to say. Is it possible? Yeah, that's, that's because you want to be diplomatic. Yeah, okay. Oh, you want to save someone's life? The Jews, yeah, during the Second World War. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in, in incident where the Jews were hiding in their homes of um, Germans, and the Germans say, you know, there's nobody, no Jews here. So that's a deliberate lie. But that's to save them, hiding in the attic or something. That to me is a good reason to do a deliberate lie. So, so obviously in those situations, what is the motivation behind it? Is the, is the motivation to, to harm someone? No, right? To actually save someone, to help someone? You know, um, you know Achan Brahmali? I think he gave talks, he gave sutta class here before. I think he was, one of his talks, he was giving example about, about you know, about this, this in a hospital, I think. About this person, is supposed to go for an open heart surgery. You know, open heart surgery is, is not a simple thing. <laughs> and then this person has got a friend who also need to go for an open heart surgery. And this friend went two days earlier. Okay? So, so the two days earlier this friend went. And the surgery was not successful. He, he died. <laughs> then comes the time for this for this person to go. So the wife, so, the, so when he was admitted to the hospital, so he asked the wife, how, how did John do? Is John okay? So what would the wife say? The wife said, oh, I'm sorry, John is gone. You know, and you're next. <laughs> All right, it's, you know, so, so, the, so the wife was thinking, if I said, yeah, John, yeah, John went in and then he died. Oh, I must keep my preset. I just observed second uh, fourth pre preset, I must not lie. So by, by telling the truth to my husband, <laughs> you know, he's, going, he's going to be so, so devastated, isn't it? And you, you don't want to be so mentally devastated when you're going for a major operation. So that could be one example. And you're talking about the Jews. And the classic example, you know, the, the always you find in Buddhist circles, we talk, you know, if one, say one evening you're walking in the dark, going home, and then suddenly you see uh, maybe a young boy ran in front of you and then told you, please hide me. And then they saw an alley, and then the boy went to the, the alley, he was hiding there. Then, very, then before long, you find four or five big size looking guys with, with parang chasing after, and then he asked, do you see, do you see someone r running in, in front, you know? And you know for sure that they, they're going to attack him. So would you say, oh yeah, yeah, he's hiding there because I, you know, I'm a Buddhist, so I've got to observe fourth precept. <laughs> All right? So there, there may be occasions, you know, where you may have to, you have to make a lie. But, but is it a lie? It is a lie. You cannot say it's not a lie. <coughs> and there's also no reason to justify saying that, oh, it's okay, I make a lie. But, you know, it's a very unfortunate circumstance. Yeah? So you make a lie. And, Buddhism, we always say that because making that lie, that deliberate lie, you create karma, isn't it? All right? But then that karma probably would be nullified by the, the, the other karma that you created by the motivation that goes in, in your mind. Because when you said that, you're prepared to, to take that whatever negative karma that may arise as a result of that, making that, that, that wrong speech, that false speech, because your, your, your motivation was you want to help someone save someone.
right? So sometimes we have this kind of uh, very, <laughs> you know, uh, circumstances. All right? There's a the saying that in samsara, you know the word samsara? Right? In samsara, nothing is perfect. Because samsara, nothing is, per is perfect. We are trying our best to make it perfect. All right? Sometimes it's not easy. All right? And then you link it back to the Buddha's teaching on the first noble truth, that there's so much dukkha in this world. So as long as we, on our part, does our level best to try to reduce the suffering that other people face. So that's our motivation. So that goes beyond the motivation. All right? So sometimes you speak to, 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 to Dharma masters, Dharma teachers, they say, whatever you do, always check your mind. Always check your motivation. All right? So I think that's very, very important. Okay? All right? so, so, but in this case here, you're, you're talking about someone who makes a deliberate lie, probably with the intention to deceive someone or to cheat someone. You know? so, so even that, you've got different categories of lie. All right? So remember in samsara, uh, samsara is not perfect. Right? That's why there's a Malay word for samsara. What is a Malay word for samsara? Samsara, isn't it? Ah, see? Samsara dalam suasa samsara. <laughs> so we're all in samsara. Right? So there's a samsara. Of course, Christian Dio also got a, got a samsara. Right? <laughs> so that, that's, you know Christian Dio? The perfume? Yeah. I remember one day I was walking at a duty free shop. <laughs> I saw. <laughs> I saw samsara. I said, wow. <laughs> so even samsara is, is, is looking, looking at, at me. <laughs> so it's a, it's a perfume. I'm not sure if it's still there. I mean, I don't use it. Now, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right. Okay, so, so this is a simile of the flower pot. Sorry, not flower pot. <laughs> the, 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 the water pot. Water pot, right? Okay, let's, let's go on to the, the sutta itself. The next one is a simile of the elephant. Right, royal elephant. Suppose Rahula, there were a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high breed, <laughs> and accustomed to battle. In battle, he would perform his tusks with his four feet and his hind feet, with his four quarters and his hind quarters, with his uh, head and his ears, with his tusks and his tail. Yet he would keep back his trunk. Then his rider would think, you know, there's, there's somebody to ride that, that royal elephant, right? This royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles performs his tasks in battle. You know, the dot, 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 dot means uh, it's a repeat. You, you, I'm sure you know by now why, why the texts are very long-winded. <laughs> huh? the, uh, the Hokkien say, Teng Kui, you know. <laughs> so some people say, why? <laughs> the suttas are, actually suttas are very short, no? but because you keep on repeating, because long. You know why they have to repeat it? Uh, to listen, because during the Buddha's time, you know, there was no PowerPoint, <laughs> there were no, no notes, you know, you, you, you can't have, you know, can't print notes. So everybody have to listen very attentively. So it's called the, the oral tradition. Right? So a lot of the, all the Buddha's teachings were actually passed down through oral tra traditions by the monks. Right? And uh, even today, increasingly less and less, but there are still some monks who can actually recite the entire uh, Pali canon, for example. You know, the, you know, the Pali discourses, there are thousands of, of them. Majima Nikaya is only 152, but uh, then you go to the Sangyuta Nikaya, the Anguttara Nikaya, there are thousands and thousands of those discourses. So, there are monks who can actually recite them, you know. So, those monks, they are called... They, they specialize in reciting, you know. In the, they, they can remember, they've got tele, telegraphic... Photographic memory, not, not telepathic, <laughs> photographic memory. <coughs> all right. So it says that Ananda. You know, all the discourses we have actually apparently came, came down from, from Ananda. He said, thus if I heard. Who is the I? I is Ananda. Uh, thus if I heard. Okay. <laughs> right. So now the Buddha uses the simile of a fighting elephant which will stop at nothing in order to win the war. So the elephants are well trained, right? So Buddha then tells Rahula that for anyone who feels no shame in telling a lie, there's no evil he will not do. So he was just like the, the elephant, they've been trained, you know, they'll do anything just to fight. So like, likewise, 
for, for a recluse right, who, who doesn't follow the, the, the teachings properly, you know, who, who doesn't follow the precepts. You know, they will, they will know, there will be no evil that they will not do. Right? So the Buddha just used again the energy, analogy of the, that, that elephant. Okay, and then the third one he uses a simile of the mirror. Okay. What do you think, Rahula? What is the purpose of a mirror? For the purpose of reflection, Venerable Sir. So too, Rahula, an action with the body should be done after repeated reflection. An action by speech should be done after reflection. And an action by mind should be done after reflection. So in other words, we have to be... So in order for you to be able to do that, you have to be... You have to learn mindfulness. <laughs> right or not? Right? So that's, that's where the, the, it's implied is the practice of mindfulness. If you're mindful, that means you're mindful of things happening one at a time. Right? So here it says, an action with the body should be done after repeated reflection. What are actions with the body? Like you look at the five precepts. Just look at the five precepts. What are actions of the body? Killing, Killing stealing, sexual misconduct. So those are actions from the body, the five, right? And of course, the five precepts are expanded into the ten wholesome and ten unwholesome actions. Okay? Then the, then the speech is expanded from just uh, lying, expanded into what? Harsh speech, divisive speech, idle gossip, and the lying, right? So then it's, it's expanded. So you add up, then you got ten. So the... the the, the ancient masters, they are, they are, they are very good in elaborating this. <laughs> All right. So, what is the action with the body? So, you know what they are. So, you look back at the precepts. Because precepts are something that we as lay people, we have to follow, right? And then, an action by speech should be done after repeated, after repeated reflection. So, speech, of course, in the five precepts, is only lying. Okay? But then, if you expand it into the ten unwholesome actions, you find that it includes things like idle idle chatter, it was harsh speech, divisive speech, slanderous speech, those kind of things, right? So, so it's a much, much more than And then action by mind, uh, an action by mind should be done after reflection. So what will be the negative actions done through the mind? Yeah, there are three, isn't it? If you look at the... Uh, in the five precepts, which, which one will be more on the mind? Huh? Liquor, the fifth precept, right? So why is the fifth precept linked to the mind part, do you know? <laughs> it muddles the mind, isn't it? It muddles the mind, right? So when people say, well, it's a little bit of alcohol, is okay, you know, well. <laughs> but if you speak to those who have done extensive meditation, deep meditation, you know, when they are in, in very calm states of mind, so even tiny drops of al alcohol would actually affect the their, their, their concentration. Right? So, so, but of course, if we only meditate once every three months and we, we meditate you know, five, <laughs> three minutes, you know, <laughs> then maybe that even you, you take a bottle of wine, it's not going to affect you because you're already drunk most of the time. You know? <laughs> All right? But then those, those people who, who try to develop the, the mind, you find that even that. You know? okay? so, so alcohol, but anyway, a lot of research have, have shown that alcohol is also not good for for forest, right? You say that you burn our brain cells, and once it's, it's burned, you never, you never get it back. Okay? Of course, there are also some research which says that a little bit of, of uh, red wine, you know, is help, is good. It helps to clear the tata in your heart. Right? So I don't know. <laughs> when I spoke to my doctor, he said, "Well, he said that that is still yet to be proven." But he said, "If you have not started, then no need to start." <laughs> <laughs> but he's, but he, he's not a Buddhist. I mean, he's not a Buddhist. He's just as a doctor. You see, the, the problem with liquor, alcohol, is that it's very addictive. You don't know when you will stop. Yeah? That's why there's a Tibetan saying that first, man takes the bottle. Then, what? Bottle takes the bottle. Finally, the bottle takes the man. You know? First, man takes the bottle. I mean, you take a bottle of wine, you just, or beer or alcohol, you just drink it. He said, well, I'm just, just drink, drinking. Once you're drunk, I'm not drinking. It's the bottle that's drinking. The so the bottle takes the bottle. Finally, you're really drunk. The bottle takes the man. You, know, you get alcoholic. And 
today countries like Russia, for example, one of the biggest problems that they face is alcoholism, you know. So it's terrible, isn't it? So if we have not started, then maybe we should not. Okay. Okay. So, so the simile of the mirror is the crux of this discourse itself. All right. So, so let's let's see what does it mean by action of the body, speech, and mind. So remember when you hear this word, action of the body, speech, and mind. Remember, they are, we are actually alluding to karma. Correct, or not? Because karma is created through body, speech, and mind. So we used to say there are three doors. Three doors that karma can penetrate, can enter. And what are three doors? The, the mind door, the speech door, and the body door. Alright? Okay. So let's look at the action of the body. Rahula, so this is the Buddha is talking, right? When you wish to do an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. So this is what you should re reflect. Would this action that I wish to do, right? Uh, I put it in italics, right? You have it in italics there? Okay. <laughs> but it's not in colour, right? It's in I italics. Right? So I wish to do with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. Right? So this is the first question that, that, that you ask. Something that you want to do, have you done it yet? No. It's going to be in the future. Something that you wish to, to do with the body. Will it lead to your own affliction? Affliction, you know the meaning, right? That means your own suffering, your, your own pain, your own uh, unhappiness, right? Affliction, right? Or to the affliction of other people. Or will it lead to other people's misery, other people's suffering and, and so on? Or to the affliction of both, both you yourself and others. So in, in, in the Buddhist way of looking at things, it's always something that you do, how does it affect you, affect others, and affect you and others? You always look at it in that sense, yeah? Is it an unwholesome bodily action? So, so, so again, what is, from the Buddhist perspective, what is considered unwholesome? The Pali word is akusala, isn't it? You know the word? Since some are new. Okay, so here it says that uh, an, an action which is unwholesome. So in the in the in the, in the text it, it says it describes our action as like two types. One is called a skillful action and an unskillful action, or you like wholesome actions and unwholesome actions. So the Pali word which you increasingly see in the text would be kusala and akusala. So kusala means wholesome, good, something useful, something you should do. Akusala, like the Malay word, akusala, I'm really in the wrong, so you should not do it. Aku, aku sudah salah. So you should not do it. So that's unskillful. And what is the characteristics of an akusala or an unskillful action? In the text, it says they've got three aspects. It is rooted. There's a root. It's rooted, R-O-O-T, rooted. Mula, mula, M-U-L-A, rooted. Rooted in greed, rooted in hatred, and rooted in ignorance. So three broad categories of greed, hatred, and ignorance. Of course, if you study this tree, then greed, there are many, many manifestations of greed. <laughs> there are different manifestations of hatred. From hatred to ill will to anger to, you know, all sorts of different manifestations. And finally, ignorance. Whereas a uh, skillful action, uh, again, you know, the traditional non-greed, non-hatred. <laughs> so it means, what is non-greed? What is the positive aspects of non-greed? Generosity, kindness, you know. Hatred, non-hatred? Compassion, right? right? Maybe joy, you know. And delusion, what's the opposite of it? Wisdom. Okay. So it has got its 
counterparts. So we should try not to uh, develop any action which is unskillful. Why? Because then from greed, hatred, delusion, the result is greed will lead to unpleasant states. Unpleasant states of mind, unpleasant existence, for example. If in, in, in this existence, all our actions are akusala, all our actions are rooted in greed, hatred and delusion. So Buddhists believe that when you die, then this, the results of this action will just continue, carry forward to the next life. So the next life will be a life of what we call unhappiness, life of misery. So that's the way generally how karma works. Okay? I said generally, yeah? <laughs> because um, the Buddha gave two discourses on karma. One is called the lesser discourse on karma and one is called the greater discourse on karma. So you read these two discourses, the, the lesser discourse, chula, remember the word chula? So it's called chula kama vibhanga sutta, lesser discourse, where very e easy to understand. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. But life sometimes is not that simplistic, right? So then he preached another, he, dis, he taught another discourse called the greater discourse on karma, which is maha, right? So maha kama vibhanga sutta. In that discourse, he explains why sometimes we look, at, we, we, look, we look around, we say, hey, this guy, you know, he's a most terrible person. He should be in Sungai Bulo long ago. Why is he still loitering around, you know? Why, why, why? So, so, in, so from the, if you understand the law of karma, sometimes people have such good store of merits in the past that he's just living on the results of those good past merits. Okay, but all those things will end. It's a matter of time. But we don't know when. <laughs> the question is we do not know when. All right? So it may be another five years, another could be his next life. All right? So similarly, sometimes you find some people he is so so kind, so you know, so so saintly, so generous in every as aspect, but he's so full of suffering, so misery, you know. So, because he doesn't just have enough supportive karma from the past life. But if he continues to do good, continues to generate good karma, then, you know, maybe tomorrow, day after tomorrow, then people say his fortunes change. Actually, fortunes don't change. It's because of our karma. Our karma... So, what we do in the present is very important. The karma that we did in the past, we can't do anything about it. It's already done. You can't do anything about it. And, and what is going to happen to you in the future will depend on what you do now. Okay? So if you've done a lot of negative karma in the past, which are just waiting to ripen, but in this life, you, are, you know, you've done a lot of wholesome deeds, actions, and, and so on. So even when those negative karma, when they ripen, in this life, because you have such a good store of merits in this life, then you can dilute some of those negative karma. Right? But if in this life you also never do, do any good things, then all the, when the bad karma ripens, there's nothing to, to, to actually uh, kind of uh, counteract or, or dilute the bad, bad karma. Right? So that, that's why in Buddhism you always say merits are very important. You must always do good deeds. Because when you do, the result of doing a lot of kusala actions is that you generate a lot of merits. Punya, punya. Right? And, and what did the Buddha say is a store of merit? Punya, kiriya, vada. Three stores of merits, dana, sila, bhavana. That means generosity, morality, and wisdom. So if you do these three, a lot of generosity, a lot of uh, morality, keep your precepts strong, and then, you know, uh, you're not always with a muddled mind. <laughs> All right? Then you find that you actually generate a lot of, of uh, good, good merits. All right? So that will... That will protect you. Even if it doesn't protect you this life, it protects your future lives. It's, it's never lost. So we, we must so understanding that is called right view. Right? But you don't understand that, you think, oh, you know, in this life I've done so much good, you know, but I don't seem to get good results. Uh, this 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 karma that doesn't work. So from the Buddhist perspective, you don't have enough faith, so no not enough sata, so then you find that the, the thing will break. Okay? So always re remember. The bad karma that ripens, you have sufficient good karma, you can always dilute it. And how do we know?
So if you read that sutta called Lona Pala Sutta, you can just Google Lona Pala Sutta, it you come up. That discourse is called the the, the the salt crystal sutta. Salt crystal. A lump of salt. It's like you know you have a glass of water? You have a glass of water or a cup of water. If I put a lump of salt, if I put a lump of salt into this this bot uh, this this cup, what, what happens when you drink it? Become salty, right? But if I pour this cup of or this cup of water with one lump of salt into a basin of clear water, when you taste it, would you taste it? You will not taste the saltiness, right? But does it mean that there's no salt there? There is salt there. But it's just that you don't taste it. So it's the same, you know, if if you have done a lot of good karma, even that one lump of saltiness that you have, you pour into a whole basin of water, even though it is there but you will not taste the, taste the salt. Right? So, so that, you read that, that the discourse, a very interesting discourse called Lona Pala Sutta. So it explains about why it is so important for us to always generate uh, good merits. Right? Because good merits will then consistently support us in our spiritual practice. And then it help, helps to strengthen our faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha also. Right? Okay. So, okay, let me, we go on, right? Okay, so that's the action of the body. So I'm just explaining about this concept of wholesome and unwholesome. So remember, wholesome, uh, it has got three roots, right? Both greed, the negative side, as well as the positive side. Negative roots and positive roots. So paranai, huh? Okay, when you reflect, third line, when you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to do with the body would lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, it is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you definitely should not do such an action with the body. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to do with the body would not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, then it is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with, hope, with pleasant results. Then you should do such an action with the body. So the Buddha was very, uh, very analytical here. You know, he, he tells you exactly. Okay? Now, para 10. Now, if you look back at para 9, the first sentence is, Rahula, when you wish to do an action. You, you see that line? Now, para 10, also Rahula, while you are doing an action, so the first one, para nine, is save for the future. And para ten is the present. Correct? Presently, that's what you're doing. The present, isn't it? While you are doing an action. In a bit of doing an action with the body, you should also reflect upon that. Same bodily action. Does this action that I am doing with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction? So the rest is the same. Alright? So the rest is the same. And then para eleven. Also, Rahula, after you have done an action, so this is when? The past, really. <laughs> right? So you see, in these three paragraphs, para 9, para 10, and para 11, the Buddha brings in the dimension of time, isn't it? What is time? What is the concept of time? Time only exists because you have got three dimensions, right? You've got the past, you've got the present, and you've got the future. Otherwise, what is time? But is it real? Time is not real, isn't it? Is time real? Time is a concept. Right? That is why, what is the time now? Now is 1.30. Right? Today, I, which I've just finished my lunch. I'm talking to, to, to you. In, in America, people will be sleeping. 1.30. Right? In London, people just woke up. <laughs> right? So you see, time, time is not a, a concept. Uh, time is a concept, you see. All right? So it is said that um, uh, you transcend time. <laughs> How do you transcend time? Right? Okay. okay. So the para 11 is after Rahula. After you have done an action with the body, you should reflect upon that action. Does this action that I have done with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or the affliction of both? Was it unwholesome? Was it wholesome? Right? So, so, so you reflect on this. So, can you follow the, 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 the rationale here? Para 9, 10, and 11. So, talking about the body, and then he's saying that when you want to do something with the body, 
<laughs> when you want to uh, say help someone or you know say you want to do dana for, for for example want to give something right you give give some donation so so you think is it a wholesome action so, so before you want to to do it you think about it what is my motivation in doing dana what is my motivation is it to help the help the people you know in the you know maybe you want to give a donation to build a hospital what is the purpose what is the motivation of your doing it right so you so you you, you reflect on that is your motivation wholesome or unwholesome right it's wholesome because you want to help help someone right and then so you so you draw a check maybe a 5000 ringgit check so you want to give donation then at a point of doing it all right so at a point of issuing that that, that check it, what happens in, in your mind? Is it wholesome or is it unwholesome? Be in the issue, you say, ah, yeah, maybe I shouldn't give 5,000. <laughs> maybe I just give 500 ringgit. <laughs> so, so that stinginess arises. You say, now, what to do? Check already, return it. So you give that one. So after that, you reflect, ah, yeah, regret, I shouldn't have given. <laughs> you know? Then you find that, that that positive thought actually changed. Right? Or it could be initially, you know, uh, you, you give some, something, you do a generous action. And after giving something, well, you thought, oh, you feel so good, you know, you give 5,000 ringgit. Then when they talk around, you found that you are the one giving the smallest amount. Everybody give 5,100, 5,200, some give 6,000. Then you begin to feel terrible. Say, oh, yeah, how can, you know, how can I should have, they should have told me that I give more, you know. Because you, because you, you because remember the, the earlier sutta about ego-centered wishes? So you always want, want to feel that, you know, I'm better off than other people. If, if you want to give dana, I must be the number one. All right? uh, isn't it? So that's why in, in Buddhism, there's, uh, there's two words here. Dana and Chaga. I think everybody knows the word Dana, right? You always hear the word, well, let's come to the temple, we do Dana, you know, and think things like that. So Dana means generosity, right? Yeah, it means it's a good, good act, right? But sometimes when you do, you can do Dana with a lot of uh, greed in your mind. You can do Dana with a lot of anger in your mind. You can also do Dana with a lot of ignorance in your mind, very, very, very muddled, you know? People say, give give money to donate, you say donate, la. Oh, I don't know what they want, <laughs> so you just give, you don't know what it's for. Right? Anger, sometimes people give out of anger. You know, can, is it possible to, to, to give out of anger? Yeah, sometimes people say, you know, I, you know, like for example, the beggar, you know, you see the beggar walking towards you and then you, and you know that from far you can smell that he has not been taking his shower for the past two weeks or two months. So you don't need to come near you. So immediately you take out, you take out some money, you throw at him, you say, please take this money and go away. Don't, don't come near me. So you're giving him, right? You cannot say, I'm not giving, but you're giving him out of anger, out of unpleasantness, you know, not out of, well, not out of well-being or say, oh, you know, I want to help you. Out of greed, you know, sometimes people give because they want to know whether, you know, by giving so much, what do I get in return? You see, some people say, oh, if I give you this, you know, what do I get back in, in, in return? All right? Or if I give 5,000 ringgit, will my name appear on the, on the top of the list or would it appear somewhere hidden there? You know? So that is still giving, right? But those kind of giving, the results will be mixed. You say it will be mixed. You, it's, it's not pure. But we cannot say it's not giving. We cannot say it's not good. It's, it's good, but it's, it's mixed, right? So then there's another word called chaga. Chaga is when you, when you give something without any expectations. You know, you, you give because you, you know it is good to benefit other people. So that, that ego is, is not there. The ego doesn't arise. Right? If someone says, uh, can you donate to this uh, 
to, to this shrine hall, then you say, oh, okay, I'll see how, how much I can afford, then you just give. Right? Or someone says, look, I'm going to set up a hospice, then you say, oh, okay, that's a good thing. You know, so you, you know, okay, that 500 ringgit that I give will benefit them. But you never have that thought in your mind that, oh, by giving this 500, how? Uh, give 500, next life, where do I reborn? Uh? Next, born in heavens. Uh? <laughs> so you never have that thoughts, you see? You never have that thoughts. Right? Uh, or some people say, you know, you want to be born beautiful, give flowers. You know? <laughs> give flowers, uh, whoever give flowers. Yeah. <laughs> so next life, born very beautiful. Right? But then probably they forgot, flowers only beautiful for one day. <laughs> so if you have those thoughts, then, well, it kind of uh, dilute the, 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 the purity of, of that action. Okay? So even in the, for example, in the text, it talks about dana and chaga. So while both are, are good qualities, right? we always say dana, sila, bhavana, it's good. But the important thing is how, how do we make sure that the dana that we do, we don't, we don't ask for things in, in return. If it's good to give, we just give. All right? Okay? For example, chaga, you, from that you have got what is called chaga nusati. See, today we are, we, are, we are talking about reflections, isn't it? So you can reflect on the qualities of the Buddha, the dhamma uh, Buddha nusati. You reflect on the nine virtues of the Buddha. Right? You did not recite, but it's part of the, you know, normally part of Buddhist liturgy. We say, itipiso, pakawa, arahang, samma, samputo. So all those nine things, right? And then you also re re reflect, you reflect, contemplate, right? On the six virtues of the Dhamma, right? Swakato, pakawata, dhammo, sanditiko, akaliko, and so on, the six virtues. So reflect, what are the six virtues? And then the nine qualities of the Sangha, right? So likewise, you can reflect on the qualities of the generosity that you have done. So it's called chaga nusati. For example, before you retire to bed, I don't, I don't mean retire from, from work, retire, to, retire for, for the day, you go to sleep. <laughs> when, you go to, when you go to bed, you can, you can reflect. Oh, what did I do today? Oh, today I attended <laughs> a Dhamma talk, okay. Right. But did I, do, did I do anything? Maybe you know, I, I went to clean the toilets. <laughs> Or, or, or I did something, or I make a, a donation, or I help, I help out in the in the Sunday school, you know, uh, you know, or you know, in, in the office. To today, I I, I help uh, a fellow colleague who was very depressed because he, because you know he had a very bad appraisal from the boss. So did you do something that is positive? Did you do something that kind of help someone reduce his dukkha? So so that is something. So before you retire to bed, then you try to reflect. On, on, on those good things. Right? Then you have a sound sleep. Then you sleep very well. <laughs> okay? So that is called Chaga Nusati. Right? So we can do a lot of things, you know. And uh, maybe that helps you to sleep, sleep better, isn't it? Uh, if you, have, you, have, you cannot sleep one, so you try, try this. Uh, maybe, the, maybe if you try that, then you find that, hey, I've never done, did not do anything good at all. In fact, I've done terrible things. Probably have nightmares after that. <laughs> Okay. But that is to remind you that then you should do something good, something positive. Right? Okay. So this is the explanation on that. So that's on the body, right? Then for speech, so it's the same, right? So I won't go through the details. So action of speech, when you wish to do an action by speech, early on was by body, right? So when you wish to do an action by speech, you may, you may do such an action by speech. So then the second one, while you are doing. So again, the three, time, the three dimensions. When you wish, that means one, you want to say something. So before you want to say something, make sure you, 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 you reflect on what you're going to say. Uh, yes. Yes. On, on that point, so should, as Buddhists, right, should we continue to encourage others to do good on the basis of accumulating merits? Because I notice that's quite a common way to motivate good deeds, right? But then again, that dilutes, you know, the original intention of doing good might not be to actually help the person, but instead to, to just get merits. Ah, uh, well, yeah. I, I, well, this is like a paradox, you know, it's like a paradox. While we say good actions lead to good results, so you get a lot of merits. But our, our task is not to aspire to get all these merits. Our job is just to do good. Because when you do good, automatically merits will arise. Right? Strangely enough, paradoxically, the more you do good and you keep on thinking about what merits will, will I get, your merits get less. 
Yeah. If you do something good, you feel happy about it, naturally, you know, the merits will be there. But each time when you do something good and you tell yourself, okay, if I do this, how much merits will I get? If I do that, will I get more merits? Then you, then you become a spiritual materialist. You know the word spiritual materialist? Oh. All right. Yes, just like in the, in, the, in the office, if I do more work, you know, then I get more money. Like the boss says, you know, you achieve, you achieve 110% sales, you know, I give you more, more money. All right. So that's, you know, which is fine. You know, but, in, but spiritual, some people, they have that. So our brother is right that whatever we do, we should not have this thought at the back of our mind that, oh, I do this because I want to have more merits. But because you don't have the, this thinking about wanting to have merits, automatically the merits will come. Right? So, so I, that's a good, good question. So I think it's very important for us not to be attached to merits. Not, not to be attached to the results of all the good things that we read in the scriptures. Right? Like the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta says, right? you want long life, then you do this. You want to have a beautiful face, then you do that. Then you think, okay, you want to have a beautiful face, you know, then what type of flowers should I buy? <laughs> should, I, should I buy daffodils? Should I buy orchids? You know, then you think, then, you know, it defeats the whole purpose. Right? Or maybe buy hibiscus cheaper. You know? <laughs> then that's, that's not the purpose. Right? The suttas just explain that this action leads to these results. Right? But if you cling to, to those things, if you have a craving for, for, for those things, then strangely enough, those things get less and less. All right? It's only when you... When, when you, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a Taoist uh, the, 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 the saying, that, that the, the way of inaction, you know? Like the, the more you want something, the more you will not get it. You know? All right? Isn't it? Uh, but we should set our mind to aspire to do good things. So I think the only aspiration we should always aspire is to do as much good as we possibly can. Because if you have that aspiration, the more good that, that you, you do, naturally the result will be there. You don't have to bother about the result. It will be there. All right? That's why you notice the Buddha talks about Eightfold Path, right? He talks about the way. You. He doesn't really talk about if you have right views and this is what you get. These are benefits, but number one, right speech, three benefits. You know. <laughs> it doesn't work in that way. It doesn't work in that way. Okay? Okay. Right, so the action of speech. So likewise, uh, so before you say something, always think. All right? These things that I'm going to say um, in the Vacha Sutta, the Buddha talks about the five characteristics of speech. Basically, that speech that, or that something that you're going to say, it must have certain characteristics. There are different variations on huh? what constitutes a good speech. So before we say something, we reflect, does our speech have these ingredients? Is it useful? All right? And uh, there's a discourse which the Buddha gave. Uh, there are six categories. That discourse is, is, is called... Uh, and, and anybody remembers? <laughs> it's called Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta. Huh? Abhaya, you know, Baya, Bahaya. Danger. So Abaya, no fear. So Abaya Raja Kumara. So the name of the prince is Raja Kumara. So the prince of no fear. <laughs> he has got no fear. So Abaya Raja Kumara Sutta. So in that discourse, the Buddha says as, uh, there are six types of speech that a person makes. A person makes a speech which is true, which is useful, which is pleasant. A speech which is true, which is useful, which is unpleasant. A speech which is true, useless, pleasant. <laughs> speech which is true, useful, unpleasant. So a speech which is false, useful, pleasant. False, useless, 
<laughs> present. So, so you do up, you do all, all the so they actually six, uh, six computation, right? Now, that's another discourse, so I won't have time to go into it. <laughs> so that, that is called the Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta. So what we can pick from that discourse is, the Buddha says that he, the Buddhas only make speech, make a statement which is true, which is useful, sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant. Okay? Sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant, depending on the time. So it's timely. The timeliness of, of it. Alright? A speech which is Pleasant, I think everybody knows, right? No, no question. A person which is unpleasant. For example, when the Buddha was trying to encourage his, his monks or his, or his disciples to practice hard, so he would say, Oh, do you know that your hair is, everything is on fire? Your six senses are on fire? Your hair is on fire? Your eye is on fire? Your nose is on fire? So it's kind of to jerk them up, you know? Okay? So he used those, those kind of analogies to, to kind of push them on their practice. Or he said, You know, do you know that, the, that, that, that we, we, we are this precious human life? The next day, we, we hang on the, on like, like, the, like a thread, like the line of, of a thread. You know, we, we, we can die any time, isn't it? We have seen people who are young and healthy, they just die. People who are old, you expect them to die, but they, 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 they cannot die. <laughs> you know? isn't it? Right, right? People, you think that they, they should die, but they never die. But people young and healthy, you know. Every day exercise, play golf, play, play squash, you know, poop. You know, squash got they fall down and die. <laughs> How do you explain that? Isn't it? So that, that is a reminder. That's a, that's a re reminder. Okay? So that every day is a precious day. All right? So don't forget that. So a speech that is, that is useful, timely, true. Uh, what is that? Right? Uh, kindly spoken. You spoke with a kind thoughts, you know. And then always speak with metta, with, with loving kindness. In others, loving kindness is inherent in you. Right? So the Buddha says these are examples. So there are two suttas there. One is the Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta, and the other is the Vacha Sutta. Vacha means speech. V A C A. Vacha Sutta. So if you read these two, then it gives you the full explanation about what the Buddha considers about speech. So how do we develop that? Okay? It is said that the Buddha only makes statements. You know the difference between statements and arguments? Most of the time, we make statements or we make arguments. We make arguments. <laughs> because statements are either true or false. The Buddha, for example, is it raining or is it not raining? It's not whether it's good or it's not good. <laughs> Correct? So, it's, uh, whereas argument is, or oh, is, she is beautiful or he is clever, that is subjective. Right? So, when you talk about, about the arguments, they are valid or invalid, not true or false. Okay, so that's a the difference. So he said that when the Buddha makes statements, it is always true or false. Okay, so that's it. All right, good. So let's go on. So that's on, on speech, right? So remember, before you say something, while you are saying it, and after you have said it. So always reflect. Should I have said it? All right? Maybe you, you say something that is true, but it's not timely. You know, so don't 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 say la. Like for example, you know, you just attended the intensive retreat. You're learning about anicca, dukkha, anatta. You, you attended meditation. Then your friend invited to a wedding. Then you say, oh, you know, <laughs> congratulations. But do you know that the life is impermanent? You know, <laughs> well, that's, that's not the right time. The guy just got just got married. You know, then you tell him that your marriage will be impermanent because you say, the Buddha says all three characteristics. <laughs> well, that's true but not so useful, right? And not so timely. It's not timely, right? So that is why the Buddha used the word skillful. Skillful. You must know. You know, the Buddha was so skillful, sometimes he said that the Buddha has got four ways of answering questions, or answering que questions, right? But we only have one, one, one way of answering questions. One way is he answered, <coughs> how does Buddha answer questions? One is he answered with a yes, or he answered with a no. And then he, he answered with a counter questions. Third one. Huh? The first one is yes or no, categorical. It's called a categorical answer. Right? Then the second one is he answered with a counter questions. The third one is he answered a question by analyzing your question. <laughs> right? And the fourth one is how? No answer. Noble silence. Huh? So most of the time we say, cannot answer, keep quiet. <laughs> but <laughs> that is not the case for the Buddha. Right? The Buddha chose to remain silent because he found that it wasn't the right time to, to explain. 
a particular point to a particular person. And there are many occasions, like for example, there's one when the Buddha was talking to this monk named Vachagota. Vachagota? Vachagota was a Brahmin. You know, Brahmins during the Buddha's time, they always believed that when they die, this soul of theirs will reunite with Brahma, the Lord Brahma. So they always believe in that. But because the Buddha was such a charismatic teacher and many people got drawn to, to him, so this Vachagota being a Brahmin, he was also attracted to the Buddha's teachings. But this concept of this, the soul, whether this soul when he dies, would it really reunite with Brahma? Or there's no soul? Because the Buddha talks about anatta. So he wasn't sure. So he decided to ask the Buddha. Right? So one day he went to see the, the Buddha. So he asked the Buddha, he said, Oh, venerable sir, he says, I've got a question for you. So the Buddha said, Okay, Vachakota, what's your question? He said, Tell me, do I have a soul or do I not have a soul? All right? Then the Buddha looked at him and then remained silent. <laughs> then, then he was a bit taken aback. Second time he asked the Buddha again, Do I have a soul or do I not have a soul? Second time the Buddha remained silent. You know, of course, the text is must have three, three times, right? <laughs> so then he asked the third time. <laughs> okay? He asked the third time. Do I have a soul or do I not have a soul? And for the third time, remained silent. So Vachakoda got upset. He left. Probably he think, ah, this guy hopeless, he doesn't know the answer. So he left. And as usual, Ananda was seated next to him. So Ananda was curious. Why did the Buddha has always talked about anatta, non-self? Why didn't he just explain to Vachakoda? Then he asked, Ananda asked the Buddha, Oh Lord, why did you not explain to Vachagota the teaching of Anatta. And what did the Buddha say? Buddha says, Vachagota has all his life been a Brahmin, praying to Brahma and always believed that he has got a soul. All right? And if today I tell him he don't have a soul, he's going to be shattered. <laughs> he's going to be broken. He's going to be destroyed because he's not ready to accept it. All right? So, whatever I say, he's going to misinterpret it. So because of that, well, the Buddha could read his mind, eh? uh, you know. <laughs> so, Buddha said, because of that, the time was not right. It wasn't timely. Right? But of course, you read the text, it says, subsequently, Vachagota became a, became a disciple. Right? So, sometimes the right time. But unfortunately, we are not Buddhas, eh? so, so we don't have that, that ability. <laughs> but we definitely can, can develop some, some basic skills. Uh, all right? What not to say. All right? So, uh, don't say, you know, I've... I mean, if you want to remain silent, just <laughs> you can remain silent, but don't, don't say it because you are the Buddha. <laughs> 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 All right. So, Buddha, huh? <laughs> Buddha said so, right? <clears throat> okay. So, speech. So, speech plays a very important part, All right. So, that, that's why it is said that, uh, uh, you know, what is con considered as proper speech? Proper speech is linked to. I remember li listening to some teachings by Achan Amaro. You know Achan Amaro? He was, I think he was, maybe he didn't come to BJF. He was at the Banda Utama. He was giving a talk of, about compassion. And in his talk on compassion, he was talking about speech. How important that right speech <coughs> can actually help to, you know, it's a reflection of your compassion, what you say to other people. And when you say the right things to other people, people feel Com <clears throat> feel comforting, right? So that says compassionate. But he also said something in his talk that it's not just always telling people what is good, you know. It's not always that. It's also listening. Sometimes we must be able to listen to people. Uh, when you listen to people, that is, a, that is also a sign of compassion that you, that you actually listen. And, and actually, interestingly, he gave the example of Guan Yin. You know Guan Yin? Guan, Guan, Guan Xiyin, right? Guan Xiyin. Those who know Mandarin, what does Guan Xiyin mean? From the word hear, right? Ah, you see, Guan Xiyin, Guan Yin means one who hears the sound, one who hears the sound of the world. And what is the sound of the world? What is the sound of the world? Is it only rock and roll music and, <laughs> and, and, and dukkha, right? suffering? So Guan Yin listens to the world, all right? So then Kuan Yin is depicted as many hands, you know, many, many arms, right? To help as many people as possible. 
Now that is a very important point because from the word itself, so, that, so I always tell people, you know, there are some very orthodox Theravada, they say, oh, where got Kuan Yin? Kuan Yin is rubbish, no such thing as Kuan Yin. So I say it doesn't matter if you don't believe in Kuan Yin, but do you, do you think compassion is, is an important quality? Of course. So Kuan Yin symbolizes compassion. So even if you don't believe in Kuan Yin, it doesn't matter, but practice compassion. And when you practice compassion, you are like Guan Yin. <laughs> right? Right? Like, you are like Guan Yin. That means when you are able to hear the sound of other people. Okay? So you become like a, like a good, good, uh, good psychotherapist, isn't it? Good psychotherapist, you know, what do they do? You got a problem, you see a psychotherapist, their job is just to listen to you. <laughs> right. At the end, end, end of, the, at the end of that uh, two hours session, you are poorer by probably, you know, <laughs> Uh, 1,500 ringgit? Yeah. You don't believe me, you ask Dr. Pang Cheng Ka and say, <laughs> whether it's true or not. Their job is to listen. Right? But if, you, if, a psycho, if a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist spend all the time talking, then he's not a good psychiatrist. <laughs> right? And I think in that talk, Achan Amaro also said something like, sometimes when a person asks questions, actually he already has the answers to those questions. He actually have to have the answer. So all he needs is someone to listen to, to him with kindness and compassion. All right? so, when, so when somebody has a problem, kind of talk to, to you, just sit down, listen. Don't, don't say, sorry, I'm not trained. I have not gone through BGF counselling unit, so, so I, I cannot help you. No, no, no. I think they just want you to listen to them. Right? Just listen, listen to, to them. At the end of the day, say, oh, is it so? Oh, really? Oh, then... What do you think? Uh, and then, and then, and then they say, oh, thank you so much. Actually, they found the answers after <laughs> just talking to you. Uh, isn't it? Uh, but, but they are poorer by a few thousand bucks. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's speech. So you see, when the, the Buddha told Rahula, right, told the son, action of the mind, Rahula, when you wish to do an action by the mind, so it's the same again. So before you... <clears throat> he said, before you, before you start to think about what you want to think, <laughs> all right, before you think, all right, while you are thinking and while, and, and while you have done, while the thoughts have already arisen, okay, you ask yourself, did you have a good thought? Did you have a positive thought? Did you have a skillful thought? Or were you thinking of something positive? Were you thinking of something negative? Again, only you will know, isn't it? No, no, nobody can read your, your, your mind. Only you can know. All right, so all these are for self-reflection. Okay? So, para 15, 16, 17 is about when you wish uh, to do an action by mind while you are doing it in the present and in the past. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so purity of the three doors. So let, let's see what's... I, I put some of these on the slides here. Okay? So you reflect. So I, I just put it in a chart here. Will this mental, so, so I've, I've just summarized it, right? So will this mental, verbal and bodily action cause harm to me and others? So you, re, you, you, you reflect, right? Future, if yes, then don't do it. If no, then you can carry on, right? So I've just sum, so I'll summarized this for you. And then you, you, you assess, is this mental, verbal, bodily action causing harm to me and others? This is your present action. If yes, then you stop doing it now. If no, you can continue. Right? And the last one is you review. All right? What do you review? What has happened in the past, isn't it? Did this mental, verbal, bodily action cause harm to me and others? Read in the past, right? If yes, it did, then don't do it again. But if it didn't, then okay, it's a wise action. All right? Okay, so three things. So you reflect, you assess, and then you review. What do you reflect? You reflect on what you want to do in future. You reflect what you want to do in, in, in future in terms of body, speech, and mind. Okay, and then you assess because you have already done it. So you assess. You re, all right? You assess it. Is this what you have done? Is it? You want to continue doing it or not? And then you review. You've already done it. You've already done it. So did this mental, verbal, bodily cause harm to me and others? If yes, then don't do it again. If no, 
Okay, it's a wise action, you can do it. So you see, the Buddha gave a very simple but very systematic uh, approach on how do we reflect. Okay, so the purity of the tree, the tree dot. So the last text here says, Rahula, all those Brahmans and contemplatives in the course of the past who purified their bodily actions, verbal actions and mental actions did it through repeated reflection on their bodily actions, verbal actions and mental actions in just this way. Okay? And all those Brahmans and contemplatives in the course of the future who will purify their bodily actions, verbal actions and mental actions will do it through repeated reflection on their bodily actions, verbal actions, mental actions, in just the same way. So this is the future. All right? And the present. All those Brahmans and contemplatives at present who will purify their bodily actions, verbal actions, mental actions, they do it through repeated reflection on their bodily actions, verbal actions, and mental in just this way. <laughs> okay? So it's, it's, it's a repetition of, of, of that, but it, it's kind of to emphasize that whatever we, we do, all right, you want to do your future action, your present action, your past action. If it's a past action, it's already done. So you review it. Was it a good action? Was it not a good action? If it's a good action, okay, you can't continue. If it's not a good action, do you want to do it again? No. Right? Your present action, now you are, you are doing it. You review before you even do it. Now I'm, I'm thinking about it. You know? How? Sh sh should I do it? Should I not do it? All right? And then, of course, the future. So always the past, present, and future. So conclusion, thus Rahula, you should train yourself. I will purify my bodily actions through repeated reflection. I will purify my verbal actions through repeated reflection. And I will purify my mental actions through repeated reflection. So that's how you should train yourself. Right? So this is a shorter this is a short this this course, but I think it sums up very neatly, right? What how we, we should do. Okay. So what is the <coughs> So you have the you have the the, the, the sutta. Itself. So go back and read the, the the sutta. So what is our takeaways? All right. What is the takeaway? What is our practice from this short su 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 sutta? I can think of three things. One is, for example, if you look at the suttas, number one, it asks us to take time, asks us to take time to reflect on what is wholesome, what is unwholesome behaviors. All right. It actually forces us to to think. For us to reflect, what is the action that we have done? What is wholesome? What is unwholesome? Again, only you will know, right? Okay, that's one. Second, you consider or you try to, well, in the, you see, the, the monks, when they do a wrong action, they will confess that action to a, to a, to a fellow monk. Maybe for lay people, you know, we don't have that that practice of confessing <laughs> or, or you know, admitting what we have done to, to a monk. Well, if you have a, a teacher that you, you really res respect, you can, you can do that. You can tell, oh, Bante, you know, oh, you know I, I just want to confess to you that, that this, this was an unwholesome action that I did. You know? I hope that, you know, uh, with, with, you know, that after this I will not repeat that you know, with right efforts. So then when you when you admit something, and then the chances of you repeating it will, will, will be less. Okay? So that's, that's, that's what, the, what we could do. But if you, if you don't have a monk that you can go to, or even someone that you go to, then you, if you have a Buddha image at your home, then you go in front of the, of the Buddha. <laughs> Isn't it? Because then you don't have to feel any in inhibitions. Right? So you, in front of a Buddha image, you bow down to a Buddha image, you just pour out all your, <laughs> all your wrongdoings that you have, you have done. You say, oh... You know, I've done this, you know, I, I wish I had not done it, but I've already done it. You know, I will make sure, I'll make a firm determination. In Pali, it's called Aditana. In Pali, Aditana means determination. You know, it's, Aditana is one of the ten paramis, isn't it? Ten perfections. Uh, aspirations. So you make a strong aspiration, you make a strong determination in front of a Buddha image. Right? You say, look, I've done this, you know, I should not have done it, I will not do it again. Right? So no, nobody knows, right? Only the Buddha knows. Right? So, he, so it's okay, right? Uh, uh, right? The, the Buddha cannot, cannot scold you then. Uh. <laughs> but you see, but I think it's good. You always to, 
You know, it's always good to, to tell what you want to do to, to, to somebody else. You know? Like for example, even in, in leadership development training, uh, uh, I don't know, if you have been to leadership development training, you know, at the end of a leadership program, uh, you will always be asked to make a declaration of action, isn't it? Right? What, what you will need to do to achieve the targets or you know, to achieve the tasks that have been set upon. And research has shown that you can make as many declarations of action as you want, but if those declarations of action is not made in front of someone, like your boss or even your colleagues, the probability of it being, being successful is much less compared to if you had done it. Right? So th th those are research firms. Right? I can give you the Harvard Business Review article. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I read that and I, and I told one of my group of of uh, vice presidents in, in, in Minneapolis about in September. So I, I told them, yeah, you don't trust me, but this is what Harvard Business Review said. <laughs> okay. So I think in the same way, uh, if you have done something wrong, you want to admit, yeah, and, and in front of the Buddha image, you know, just pour out. All right? But make sure you take action. No, otherwise, every day you're going to bother the Buddha. <laughs> then you never take action. Right? Buddha got more important things to do. Okay, so the second one is consider or try to confess an act of wrongdoing. Right? Likewise, I think you have done something good. I think you can, you can also, in front of a Buddha image, and, and, and say, look, you know, may I continue to, you know, to, to, may I continue to, to, do, to do good things, you know? Right? Like, you know, in, in, my, in my home, I've got, a, I've got a Buddha image, I've got a shrine, and I've got, I've got photos of, of late chief. <laughs> And, and photos of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Lama Zopa. And every morning what I'll do is I'll, I'll just make an aspiration, you know. May I, be, be, may I be continue to be inspired by, by, you know, by your great actions, uh, you know, to continue to, to benefit others, to share whatever little dharma that I have with other people, so that more people can benefit by it. So it's a kind of a daily as aspiration, right? So I think we can do all those things. Isn't it need not only bad things you go and tell the Buddha? <laughs> I don't you think only bad things you tell the Buddha. You know, good things that you, you want to kind of get aspiration. I think that will deepen your 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 faith, right? And I think the third thing is to recognize our mistakes, right? We all make mistakes, right? We are not enlightened beings. We are what we call putu jhanas. You know? Whirlings. We make mistakes, and that's fine. We make mistakes, right? My my boss used to say, "It's okay, you know, company. We make forward-looking mistakes." <laughs> you know what's forward-looking mistakes? Forward-looking mistake means mistakes which you learn from, so that you will not repeat. You know, many years ago, you know Jack Welch. You heard of Jack Welch? Uh, some of you have heard Jack Welch. GE, you know, GE. Well, today is is no, no longer the Leading, but it used to be one of the leading companies, General Electric, the, 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 the boss of General Electric, Jack Welch. Once, um, he has one vice president in one of the Eastern European country, and he made a loss. So he was called up to, to meet Jack Welch, and probably he thought he was going to get the sack. <laughs> so after meeting Jack Welch, Jack Welch said, okay, go back to your business. And when he left, he, he, he was wondering why didn't Jack Welch sack him? So Jack, then he asked, Jack, are you not going to sack me? Jack said, look, I, already, I just invested 11 million in you. You think I'm going to sack you? <laughs> so in others, that was a loss of 11 million. 11 million US in one of the East European, I think Bulgaria, I think GE Bul Bulgaria. So he made a loss of 11 million bucks. That means if this guy has learned what causes that loss, it's a mistake he has learned. All right, so it's an in investment. GE has really invested in him. So I sack him, that means the next person who comes may not even know what causes that, that, that loss. So, so you, you look at it in a very positive, positive way. Okay, so we, we can turn, turn around things. Right? That's called a positive mindset. Right? Forward-looking mistake. My boss always says, says that. So remember a past mistake and then reflect what you have learned from those actions so that no future mistakes will be repeated. Okay, so I think to summarize this discuss three things. One is take time to, to, to reflect on what would be considered a negative action or a positive action that you do. Secondly, if it's a negative action or even a positive ac action, tell it to somebody. If nobody to tell it, tell it to the Buddha. If it's a negative action, then 
you make a determination, aditana, that you will not do it again. If it's a good action, you ask for inspiration, all right, that you will continue do, doing it. And thirdly, recognize your mistakes. Admit them. Learn from them. And remember, past mistakes and reflect what you have learned from those past mistakes. Okay? All right? So that's this sutta. We have some time for questions. So uh, would you, any comments on this? You discuss. So it's, it's easy to understand, right? Okay? Again, it's, whether you're able to practice or not is a different thing. <laughs> okay. So, so my, my part is the easy part, just to, just to tell you what, what is in the, in the discord. Right? So after that is the, the difficult part. Isn't it? So, so one goes against it. Say again? Uh, uh, Yeah, in, in Buddhism, we don't talk in terms of sin, we talk in terms of ignorance. You know? if, you do, if you perform an unwholesome action, it has been done, okay, you know, just make an effort that you will not repeat it. All right? But you must be serious about it. <laughs> you must be serious about it. Okay? And, uh, and, and then, and then that, 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 that should be the way it is. All right. It's, it's, it's not that you've done something that is a sin, right? because there's no concept of sin in, in, in Buddhism. There's no concept of sin. Right? Sin is always like the like original sin, like in Christianity, the concept of original sin, because Adam and Eve did something bad, so we all suffer. Right? No. Your your father, your mother did something terrible, no. You if your if your mother or your father ends up in prison, doesn't mean that you go to prison, right? It doesn't mean that. So it's a different concept. Right? In Buddhism we don't have this concept of original sin. Instead of that, we have ignorance. We did something wrong because of our ignorance. So the important thing is to correct that ignorance. Okay? Anything else? Any, any comments? Any, any feedback? Yes, please. Any comments? Yeah. You don't have to ask questions. You can always give your inputs. Yeah? Refer to this uh, Bhikkhu Pati Mokha 216MA. Mm. Yeah, so it's actually a reference for the paragraph 8. Yep. Right? And that paragraph actually says that we can abide happy and glad day and night. Mm. Open space. But in, in that particular Bhikkhu Pati Mokha, um, so it's like it's advice from the Buddha to the Times and then it cannot be twice, once. I mean, as an influence for lay practitioner, wouldn't it be the same to do it 24 7? Yeah, yeah. Reflecting on the precepts. You 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 want to make reference? Are you referring to the the first first sutta? Is it the Anumana sutta? Uh, the Anumana sutta. Yeah. Okay. Not, not. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, if you read uh, system talking about Anumana Susutta, because in the monks' rules uh, called the Patimoka, they have this, this, uh, this precept called they should review himself three times daily in a way described in the Sutta. If you cannot. Do, do it, then he should do it twice or at the minimum. Now, this is from the commentaries, right? You're talking of Note 216, is it? Is it? Note 216, right? So, this is from the commentaries. The MA there means the Majima Atakata. So, this is not from the Sutta itself. The Sutta never mentioned that. Huh? So, the ancients call this Sutta the Bhikkhu Patimoka, right? A Bhikkhu should review himself three times daily in the way described in the Sutta. If he cannot do so three times, they should do it twice or at a minimum once. So your question is that as lay people, should we also do that, is it? No, I mean I find it uh, because in the paragraph earlier, I think the influence sutta is saying to be gay and night and paragraph Which paragraph is that? Uh, you tell me which number, which paragraph? No, because your patient, my patient, is different. Remember? Uh, paragraph eight. Uh, paragraph eight. 
Paragraph. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, paragraph eight. Friends, when a bhikkhu reveals himself thus, if he sees that these evil, unwholesome states are not all abandoned in himself, then he should make an effort to abandon them all. But if he, if when he reveals himself thus, he sees that they are all abandoned by himself, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome state. Yeah. So your your what, what's your question again? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is it because for months they're different? No, no. Okay, okay. I understand, understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. In para 8, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In para 8, I think what Mogalana is saying here is, is that we should, rev is that the, the, the monk should review himself, right? So it, it could be, you know, every moment, right? Every now and then. Yes, yes. But in the, in the, Commentary, what they mean is that if you can't do this at least three times, you know, he said the goddess is, should review himself three times daily in the way described. You can't do it every time, at least three times. Maybe morning, afternoon, evening. If you can't even do that, at least do it twice. If you cannot even do it twice, do it at least once. Okay? So I, I think that that is what it doesn't contradict what is mentioned in the suttas because the suttas. But basically, it says that, yeah, you should always be doing this at all times, isn't it? So that when you have, that's why I mentioned that, how, how, how do you do this? You make an effort to abandon them all by having mindfulness, right? And I think, they, 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 I think some of the commentaries also explain it as sati sampajana. Sati sampajana, that means mindfulness and sampajana, clear, clear comprehension, right? So, so we suppose... I think even lay people, we, we, we should aspire to, to, to do this, right? should aspire to do this. But here the commentary says, well, if you can't do this at least three times a day. La. <laughs> you three times also, susa twice. La. You two, twice also cannot, at least once. <laughs> All right, so, so I, I think that's what is meant. Okay? So the Buddha always sets very high standards, isn't it? Very <laughs> high standards. <laughs> Sometimes whether are we able to, to achieve those, those standards? Mm. All right, if you have no, yes. Okay, let's look at the, the which para again. Let's take for example the action of the body. Yeah, yeah. Could you tell me which paragraph you are reading? The first page, is it? Number nine. Number nine. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, para nine. Yes. Okay, which line? One, two, three, four. Okay. So you say unwholesome bodily action, dot dot dot, then you definitely should not do. Right? And then after that, at the last line, if it's wholesome bodily action, then you may do. So is it given a choice <laughs> to do or not to do? This action that I wish to do with the body would not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequence, with pleasant result. Thus, then you may do such an action. So you are saying that you, 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 you expect the word to be, then you should do such an action, is it? <laughs> oh, yeah, it means that it's something that you, you should do, like, you can do, like, you, you may do. <laughs> you may do. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 yeah, I think here, here is what I mean is, yeah, you should do it. <laughs> oh, but it didn't, it didn't use the word should. I, I'm, I'm not sure why it's not should, but by reading this, it means that it's something that we, that we should do. Right? That then you may do such an action. You, you may. You, your, your, your question is whether is it a choice, is it? 
Uh, yeah, I think you, we always have a choice. So the choice is we should do it. <laughs> right? We should do it. Uh, Yeah. I mean, it depends on many factors like the good action, the kind of use, the work. Because if we have, have not enough information to verify whether it's in yeah. the system or not. Yeah, I think the, if you look at the Buddha's teachings, he, he, he never really said that you must do this, you must do, do that, right? He never said that. But he just tells you, what, when, when you do, you lead to this result. You don't do this, it leads to this result. You, you notice, right? The Buddha never said, Tao shall not kill. <laughs> you never have that, right? Tao shall not commit sexual misconduct. <laughs> you never say that. So it's just telling, if you do this, then there's a repercussion. You just reflect on, on this. So likewise, so okay, you, you know that wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences will lead to pleasant result. It's really pleasant result. So up to you, Lord. You don't want to do. It's your it's your loss. <laughs> You're so stupid. You don't want to do. <laughs> so here it's like you know. Then you may do such an action with the body. So you may you may do it in that sense. I think put it in in that sense, lah. Yeah. I don't think there's anywhere where the Buddha was was very. Prescriptive in, in that sense, uh, you know, he, he, he will say, "Oh, well, this you do this, this what what, what will happen." That's why you know the entire teaching is causal, causal in, in, in nature, cause and cause and effect, right? So if you decide choose not to do it, okay, you don't do it, <laughs> right? But then you don't do it, then you get the, the repercussion. That's why he said that whether Buddhas arise or Buddhas don't arise, certain characteristics in the universe will always be there. You know, that the law of karma, the law of karma has no giver. In others, the Buddha did not create the law of karma. The law of karma is like Newton's third law. <laughs> you know, did anybody create the law of gravity? Nobody creates the law of gravity. It's a natural law. So karma is a natural law. It's a universal law. You follow the law of karma, you live in accordance with the law of karma, then you, then you get happiness. You go against the law of karma, you bang your head against the wall. It's just that. Okay? So that's why maybe in that sense, the, the Buddha the, doesn't sound like telling you what you must do, what you must not do. Right? Okay? Then, so the Buddha... Mm, yes? Well, here, here what, what, what it means that, that future in the sense that if I do this, what will be the result in the future? Like, like understanding of law of karma, good actions lead to good results, right? Correct, correct. Oh, for example, like the, you know, today you have, you have just say, you are, okay, right now you have just attended the Dharma talk. You definitely know what you're going to do at 5 p.m., right? <laughs> You know, when you go back, what, what, what are you going to do at 5 p.m., you know, All right? Uh, when you go back at 5 p.m., you know, I'm, say, for example, I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, give something to my neighbor, you know? So I, I, I'm, I'm going to, well, that's half something you, you, you're going to do. I'm not sure what you're going to do. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to go for a dinner tonight, you know? So, so that action, so you can also re reflect, you know? When I meet my neighbor, you know, oh, he's a very nasty neighbor, you know, I've got to be careful what, what I say, you know, you know so, so there, there, will, there will be certain things that revolve around what you want to do uh, in, af, af, after this. Uh. It's different from saying you sit down and, and start thinking, what, w what will I want to do three years from, from now? It's, it's not so much that. Because this, uh, this is an, an action you have just done, you are doing now, okay, and then next thing, you know, what, what, what I'm going to do. Right? Like, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to, after five, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go to Tan Siang, not Tan Siang, uh, Tam Wa Wan for a meeting. So, so, uh, so I, I, sh I sh surely will have some, some, some actions through my body, speech, and mind. You know, so it's, whether do I reflect on it or not is a separate thing, or I just blindly just, just go, go there without think, thinking. And once I'm, then I have to think what I'm going to say at that meeting to Venerable Wei Wu. Isn't it? I will have to think what I'm going to say to Vero Wewu. So would my actions be, be based, on, based on this? Okay? I mean, as an extension for the question, it's not so much about planning what you want to 
Mm, no. Anything that, uh, respect, but it's, it's like when you're doing interaction, when you're talking before you speak, and yes. you're trying to set things on the Yes, so yes. Before you even speak, you can catch yourself to. Yeah, exactly. Like whether you say this or something, isn't it for everything? Yes, everything yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah, that's why the, the, the concept of mindfulness comes in every, every moment that, 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 that we do. But sometimes it's not, not, not easy, isn't it? Sometimes we lose mindfulness, you know, sometimes it happens. Right? So it's a question, how do we have a state, how do we keep our mind steadily mindful? How do we keep our mind steadily mindful? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a practice. Uh. That's why it's called a practice. Isn't it? It's not always possible. Sometimes even in the midst of present action, we may do something because of lack of mindfulness. Possible, right? Uh. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's every, every, every moment. Yes, subconscious mind is, is always on, at, at play, but, but, but then we are, we are talking about if you are mindful, then whatever things that you say, you know, you, you, re, you have a, there'll be a quick reflection on, on that. So we, we, we reflect. In other words, we, we do not say, you know, the, the slip of the tongue is not the fault of the mind. Slip of the tongue is always the fault of the mind. <laughs> Isn't it? Right? We used to have the English saying, I remember we were in school, we said, a slip of the tongue is not the fault of the mind. But you study Buddhism, you say, yes, it is the fault of the mind, because it always starts from the mind. All right? So every moment. Right? So there's always the, the future will always be there, because we are, we are always anticipating the, 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 the future. It's like, like Sister said, it's not, not so much like planning for, for, for that, is it? All right? All right? Okay? I just find it interesting. Yeah, I, because I, I was listening to this talk by Brother Theo Tabijasukha, and in fact, this uh, Uniso Manasukha is a foster, and the next one is a big Sati Sonta Jaya. Yes. So, yes. Before that, and then after that, you can go on to the right. Sure, one. sure. Yeah, yeah. Sati Sonta Jaya. You can actually go into your uh, whole foundation. Correct, correct. But I think not many people stress on this Abijasukha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So you can get somebody to speak on Avijja Sutta. <laughs> yeah. So the, in fact, all the suttas have, have got its value. Uh, you know, even uh, a sutta as short as a three, a four lines. You know, many suttas in the Shangyuta Nikaya, they are like, like four paragraphs. You know, four paragraphs. So the, you read be between them, there are a lot of, a lot of good stuff there that we can, uh, we can benefit from. All right. So, Bobby, what's, what's next? Do we have a break or we continue? Or what? Not yet, is it? 3.30, okay. Alright, so we, we, we go on with Luca. Ah, okay. So we caught up with time. We are back to the schedule. Okay, we look at the last discourse. <coughs> ah, 